Hello, thank you for joining with me. We are reading in A Course in Miracles, Chapter 26, Holy Ground, Section 4, Where Sin Once Was. If you'd like to join me for a prayer, dear Father, if left to my own devices, my perception will be skewed. I surrender to you everything that I think and feel. God, please take my past, plan my future, send your spirit to redeem my mind that I might be set free. May I be your channel, God, and serve the world. May I become who you would have me be, do what you would have me do, go where you would have me go, and say what you would have me say, and to whom, dear God. God, I thank you for my many, many blessings. Section 4, Where Sin Once Was Forgiveness is this world's equivalent of heaven's justice. It translates the world of sin into a simple world where justice can be reflected from beyond the gate behind which total lack of limits lies. Nothing in boundless love could need forgiveness. And what is charity within the world gives way to simple justice past the gate that opens into heaven. No one forgives unless he has believed in sin and still believes that he has much to be forgiven. Forgiveness thus becomes the means by which he learns he has done nothing to forgive. Footnote 11, forgiveness in these sentences refers to the forgiveness of others. In other words, forgiving others is the means by which you learn that you have done nothing to forgive. Forgiveness always rests upon the one who offers it until he sees himself as needing it no more. And thus is he returned to his real function of creating, which his forgiveness offers him again. Forgiveness turns the world of sin into a world of glory, wonderful to see. Each flower shines in light and every bird sings of the joy of heaven. There is no sadness and there is no parting here, for everything is totally forgiven. And what has been forgiven must join, for nothing stands between to keep them separate and apart. The sinless must perceive that they are one, for nothing stands between to push the other off. And in the space which sin left vacant do they join as one. In gladness, in gladness recognizing what is part of them has not been kept apart and separate. The holy place on which you stand is but the space that sin has left. Footnote 12, Exodus 3, 5. Then God said to Moses, Do not come near, put off your shoes from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And here you see the face of Christ arising in its place. So I'm going to repeat that sentence. The holy place on which you stand is but the space that sin has left. And here you see the face of Christ arising in its place. Who could behold the face of Christ and not recall his father as he really is? Who could fear love and stand upon the ground where sin has left a place for heaven's altar to rise and tower far above the world and reach beyond the universe to touch the heart of all creation? What is heaven but a song of gratitude and love and praise by everything created to the source of its creation? The holiest of altars is set where once was sin believed to be. For here does every light of heaven come to be rekindled, rekindled and increased in joy. For here is what was lost to them restored and all their radiance made whole again. Forgiveness brings no little miracles to lay before the gate of heaven. Here the Son of God himself comes to receive each gift that brings him nearer to his home. Not one is lost, and none is cherished more than any other. Each reminds him of his father's love as surely as the rest, and each one teaches him that what he fears he loves the most. What but a miracle could change his mind so that he understands that love cannot be feared? What other miracle is there but this? 
And what else need there be to make the space between you disappear? Where sin once was perceived will rise a world which will become an altar to the truth. And you will join the lights of heaven there and sing their song of gratitude and praise. For as they come to you to be complete, so will you go with them. For no one hears the song of heaven and remains without a voice that adds its power to the song and makes it sweeter still. And each one joins the singing at the altar which was raised within the tiny spot that sin proclaimed to be its own. And what was tiny then has soared into a magnitude of song in which the universe has joined with but a single voice. This tiny spot of sin that stands between you is holding back the happy opening of heaven's gate. How little is the hindrance which withholds the wealth of he heaven from you. And how great will be the joy in heaven when you join the mighty chorus to the love of God. Note 13, Luke 15, 7, Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. And then we're going to carry on to the next page. In the above illusion, the one sinner repents. Who repents is you when through forgiveness you leave sin behind and join the mighty chorus to the love of God. And now we will read Robert Perry's commentary on this section. This beautiful and poetic section, which foreshadows the stunning, for they have come, and that's section 9, one of Helen's favorites, is about all about forgiveness. It's not about how to forgive, but rather about the results of forgiving. We need that. We need, we need that. We need to be inspired by those results, since forgiveness is practically the last thing we are really we are willing to really do. I'm sorry. The picture painted is this. When we stand before another person, there is usually a mound of sin between us, a mound that gets added to with each passing day. In the big picture, however, this mound is really just a tiny spot, a little hindrance to the heaven that could be ours. It is within our power then to let go of this tiny spot, to stop seeing sin in the Son of God in this Son of God, excuse me. What happens when we do? One thing is that by extending forgiveness, we feel forgiven ourselves. If forgiveness applies to this other person, then surely it applies to us too. And if we are the one granting forgiveness, then there must be something pure and loving in us. By forgiving then, we learn the most freeing of all lessons that we ourselves have done nothing to forgive. Perhaps the first effect of our forgiveness is that old mound I mentioned above is that that old mound I mentioned above has gone. The space between us is now clear so that the natural desire of everything to join is free to have its way. After years of wary separateness, we finally unite. Forgiveness, then, is more than just a private letting go. It's an internal release that has nothing to do with the other person. What begins inside us leads directly to an interpersonal experience. Indeed, the central image of this section is that the space where sin once was becomes holy ground. The place where we stand is physically the same. But experientially, it is not. It is as if an aura of holiness has arisen and engulfed us, and inside that encircling aura, different rules apply. A different world exists. Imagine being in the scene described here. Having forgiven, the wall between the two of you has come tumbling down. And as you look on this brother as if you are seeing the face of Christ, you see nothing but purity in this person and in yourself. It's as if you were seeing both of you for the first time. You feel like you are standing on holy ground, surrounded by a sacred stillness. From within this zone, the world looks new as well. 
The flowers appear to shine. The birds seem to sing a celestial song. You even sense that light beings from heaven have been attracted to this holy place. To celebrate this hallowed event, I'm sorry, you even sense that light beings from heaven have been attracted to this holy place to celebrate this hallowed event. You can swear that just beyond the range of normal hearing, you hear them singing a song of gratitude and love and praise. This song is so irresistibly sweet and vast that it pulls both of you toward itself. It feels like home, yet a home you've never known in this world. It awakens a yearning in you to join your voice to it, to let yourselves be drawn upward to the place where the song comes from, to leave this world and offer yourselves pure and whole at heaven's gate. How are we to take this poetic imagery? Are we supposed to believe this really happens? I think we can see this on two levels. On the first level, this does happen when we forgive, but it happens outside of consciousness. In our conscious experience, there is a holy feeling in the air, a kind of odor of sanctity that is the distant evidence of what Jesus describes here, but that's it. We don't get the full-blown experience. The first level reminds of cases where people have had a medical emergency and a near-death experience, but they do not consciously remember it at first, only to have it surface in their memory years later. Yet even though they don't remember it, many identifiable after-effects still grace their lives. They just don't know where those after-effects come from. Perhaps it is the same with our experiences of forgiveness. What this section describes happens unconsciously and then the after effects rise up to our conscious experience. On the second level, people do occasionally experience full blown, the full-blown version. Many years ago, my wife Nicola had a forgiveness experience that was uncanny, an uncanny mirror of several of the elements in this section. For instance, right after the emotional release she experienced, the clouds above her literally parted and a shaft of sunlight shone down. And then with her inner eyes she saw the sky filled with angels and with her inner ears she could hear them join in celebratory singing. The singing was just pure joy and ecstasy, she said, and she could feel that joy. The fact that people do sometimes experience what Jesus talks about here can give us confidence. I think that this is happening even in our more ordinary instances of forgiveness, not just not consciously, excuse me. And if that's really true, if we thereby stand on the holy ground and the lights of heaven join us to sing their song of gratitude and love, then why would we ever hesitate to forgive? Thank you so much for joining with me. Day 303, Section 4, Where Sin Once Was. I love you. Thank you.